Amen. So the title of the sermon this evening is Jew Are You? Jew Are You? Okay. Now, of course, I'm being clever here. This is kind of a play on words. Um, but you'll kind of see what I mean by that as we get into the sermon. And really what I want to talk about tonight, I guess if you wanted to put, you know, uh, categorize the sermon as to what it's about, you know, I want to talk about who the real people of God are. Is it today the, the people that are living over in modern day in Israel that call themselves Jews? Are they the chosen people of God? Or is it the modern day, is, or is it the New Testament believer that is the, 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 uh, the child of God? Is it us as, as New Testament believers that are in fact the chosen people? <coughs> so I want to kind of get into that a little bit, but um, really if you were to ask a Christian, you know, who, who are you? You know, we could ask, answer for them, well, Jew are you? You know, that's kind of the play on words that I'm using tonight. Like, you know, who are you? Jew are you? All right, you see what I'm saying there? That's what you are. Now, we would go to the modern day nation of Israel and we'd say, Jew are you? And the answer would be no. All right, we'll get into that here in a minute. So that's kind of the meaning of, of, the, of the title there. So, um, and if, by the way, if you're already getting nervous that I'm even bringing this topic up, you know, this just tells me that you need to hear it. Because we're living in such a sensitive culture today and there's so much brainwashing going on that as soon as you start to talk about, you know, who's a Jew and who isn't, people want to start pulling out, you know, the race card and calling you anti-Semitic and all of these things. And this isn't just an, some anti-Semitic rant that I'm going to go on tonight. I want to look at the Bible. I want to look at a lot of scripture. And I want to figure out tonight who's God's chosen people really are. Who are they? Okay, because there's people out there that are claiming that it's them. And there's a lot of other people that are standing up for them. You know, there's even, you know, the Zionist Christian that'll say, oh yeah, Israel, God's chosen people. You know, we got to bless them. Whosoever blesses them will be blessed. And so on and so forth. So, you know, it's an important doctrine. And it's something we got to get to the bottom of. And I'm sure most people in the room tonight have this figured out. That they've heard this kind of preaching before. They've already made their mind up on this subject. But it's good to be reminded of these things. And really, it's good to be reminded of this because when, we, when you really let that sink in, that we are God's chosen people and not the fraud that's over there, that, you know, that's something special. It makes us feel, you know, like we are special and we are. I'm not saying we're better than everybody else because of who we are or what we've done. Obviously, it's in Christ because of his righteousness, because of you know, you know, his having saved us, that we can say, you know, we are something special. We're something special in Christ. So you're there in Romans chapter 2, Romans chapter 2. And really, there's one thing I kind of, to start out the sermon I want to focus on. You know, there's one particular, uh, you know, tradition that the Jews have. There's one particular commandment that was given in the Old Testament that they still hang on to. That is a major theme in the Bible, Okay. And that is the topic of circumcision, okay? And, and probably everybody who needs to know what that means knows what that means tonight, okay? So Romans chapter 2, verse 25, the Bible says, For circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. So what he's saying here is that if you, that circumcision would profit you if you kept the law. Because when you're saying you're trusting in, in circumcision or any other tradition or any other commandment that God has given as, as your means of, of, of righteousness, you're saying, well, then, you're, then you are, you're bound to keep the whole law, is what the Bible teaches us. If you're going to keep it in one part, then you have to, you're a debtor to keep the whole law. Right. <clears throat> so what they are putting a lot of their trust in is a lot of different traditions, a lot of different Old Testament commandments, things, you know, and, and to the exclusion of other things which really, at, at the end of the day, is hypocrisy. To say, we're going to go to heaven because, you know, we're keeping these Old Testament commandments because of, uh, you know, but we're going to not do certain of them. You know, like, oh, I don't know, the sacrifice. I mean, they'll say, oh, we don't have the temple, but God taught in the Old Testament that you could just pile up some stones and have an animal sacrifice. So they want to pick and choose what things are convenient for them and to say, oh, well, we're keeping the law. That's how we're going go, to go there. That's fine. You want to try and keep the law. Just make sure you keep all of it. Whosoever shall offend in one point is guilty of all is what the Bible says. 
<clears throat> and, you know, we could go to heaven. A person, you know, technically could go to heaven. If you lived your whole life sinless, you could go to heaven. There is a second option. You know, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not because there wasn't another option of you being sinless, but because that other option is unattainable. Yep. It's impossible. So that is why he is the way, the truth, and the life. Now, <laughs> you're there in Romans chapter 2. Keep something in Romans all night. We're going to come back. And, and I know it's the evening service, and I know several have been out soul winning, and, and it's Sunday and, and all of that, but stay with me tonight, all right? We're going to look at a lot of scripture. We're going to do some reading. So he's saying in Romans 2, go to Romans 4, that circumcision profiteth, verily profiteth, if thou keep the law. But if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. So because you've broken the law, it means nothing. It's, it does not profit. And everyone has broken the law. So circumcision uh, does not profit anyone today. You know, the Jews cannot just trust in some tradition like this to get them into heaven. It won't work because of the fact that they have broken the law. <clears throat> the Bible says there's not a just, there's not a just man alive that, that, that's, uh, that sinneth not, that doeth right and sinneth not, that there's none good, no, not one. What is circumcision? Then why did God give that? Did God give signs like circumcision for people in order to work their way to heaven? Is that, was that the purpose of it? For God to say, if you're circumcised, you can go to heaven? Well, the problem with that is, you know, that would exclude, you know, about half the population, you know, women. So, obviously, that's not what he meant. What he meant by it is, is several different things. And first of all, Circumcision was meant as a sign of the faith that was within a person. That's what it was back then. It was a, a showing of the faith that they had within. And we've been reading about these type of things in Deuteronomy over and over again. Just these reminders that God gives the people of Israel to remind them of who they are and who He is. And circumcision was just another one of them. Just one of those daily reminders that were just worked into life that, that people would see and, un and understand that it had a spiritual significance. Just like all the other ones that we've read about in Deuteronomy, I won't go on about that. But look there in Romans 4, verse 4. It says, Now to him that worketh, the reward is not reckoned of grace, but of debt. You know, if you're going to trust in your works, you've got a lot of work to do. It's gonna, you're indebted, in fact. You've got, a lot of, you've got some things to work off. But to him that worketh not, but believeth in him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Even as David also described it, the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Not blessed are they who have outworked their sins. Not blessed are they who have done more good than bad. It's saying, Blessed are they who have their iniquities forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only? Now, when he's saying the circumcision only, he's referring to the Jews. That's what he, he often refers to the Jews in the New Testament, the circumcision. Okay? He's saying, does it come upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? Now, the uncircumcision would be us, the Gentile nations that are not of Jewish descent. <laughs> he says, or upon the circumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it reckoned? So they say, well, you know, Abraham believed, you know, and, and it, was rec it was counted to him for righteousness. How was it reckoned? Reckoned just means how was it counted? You know, how was he accounted uh, as being righteous? And what state was he in is what it's asking here. He's saying, uh, uh, how then was it reckoned, verse 10, was, when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? And if you know the story of Abraham, you know the answer. Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. So what he's saying is here, look, Abraham was counted righteous by faith before he even was circumcised. And that's the point he's trying to make here. And he says in verse 11, and he received the sign of circumcision. That's what he's saying it, that, it, that it is, that it is a sign, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, <clears throat> that he might be the father of them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So Abraham is actually our example to look back to and see what does it what does it mean what does it take to be saved and it's belief it's not the works of the law it's not circumcision circumcision it's not the, the the sacrifices it's not the sabbath day it's none of those things it's not the levitical priesthood none of those things 
will save us. And they knew that back then because they were all look, should have known to look to Abraham. That was the purpose that Abraham served. He was there to show them that it, he was, uh, that he was, <clears throat> uh, that's what it says there in verse 11. He received the sign of, of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had being yet uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So he's, he serves as a sign, something we can say, oh, well, Abraham, we know, was counted for righteousness. His faith was counted for righteousness, and that was it. That he was the father of all them that believe, not the father of all them that keep the law. And he says in verse 12, And the father of circumcision to them who are not of the circumcision only, but who walk in the steps of the faith that our father Ab of our father Ab Abraham, which he had yet being uncircumcised. So the first thing that we see about what was the purpose of circumcision, you know, <coughs> was... You know, that it was meant as a sign for the faith that somebody already had. It was not something that they did in order to work their way to heaven or to, to keep the law so that they could be counted righteous. You know, he's showing us that, hey, it's something that Abraham had within. He was counted as, 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 as righteous in his, by his faith. And then he went and had that done as a sign. So, <clears throat> and really what that sign was also to show if you would turn over to Joshua chapter 5, Joshua chapter 5 was that circumcision was a sign of separation from the unbelieving. It was a sign of separation from the unbelieving. <clears throat> because God, you know, he puts a difference between his people, the saved, those that believe, and the unbelieving. And, he, and, and again, we just see that all throughout the Old Testament of God trying, showing them that there's a difference between those that have, have been righteous through faith and those that have not. You know, and God goes over that again and again. And circumcision served to that end, that it was a sign of separation from the unbelieving. You're in Joshua chapter 5, look at verse 1. And it came to pass when all the kings of the Amorites, were on, which were on this side of Jordan westward, and all the kings of the Canaanites, which were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of Jordan from before the children of Israel until they were passed over, that, the heart, that their heart melted, neither was there spirit, uh, spirit in them anymore because of the children of Israel. At that time the Lord said unto Joshua, Make these sharp knives and circumcise again the children of Israel the second time. And Joshua made him sharp knives and circumcised the children of Israel at the hill of the foreskins, and this is the cause why Joshua did circumcise. All the people that came out of Egypt that were males, even all the men of war, died in the wilderness by the way after they came out of Egypt. Now all the people that came out were circumcised, but all the people that were born in the wilderness by the way as they came forth out of Egypt, Egypt, them they had not circumcised. So the purpose was they had this whole generation that had grown up, been born and grown up in the wilderness that were now the men of war that were going to go and fight the Canaanites and they had not yet received this sign of circumcision in themselves. And he's saying, look, you need to take care of this. And he looks and he says here in uh, verse 6, For the children of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness to all the people that were men of war, which came out of Egypt, were consumed, because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord, unto whom the Lord sware that he would not show them the land. <clears throat> and so on and so forth. So we see that you know, circumcision was a sign of the faith that people had within. And it was a sign to them, those believing people, that they were to be separate from the unbelieving. That there was a difference that God put between them and the heathen of the land. And God wanted that to be there. So we see also that circumcision was a sign uh, also between the Lord and Abraham's seed. And really that's, that's what the distinction is. You know, that's, what Ab that's who Abraham's seed are, the believing, right? So he's showing, hey, there's a difference between you and the unbelieving. There's a difference between uh, Abraham's seed and those that are not of Abraham's seed. Go over to Genesis chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17. This is what uh, Peter brought up to the, to the Jews, to the elders and the rulers, when he was, he was uh, accosted of them in Acts chapter 7. And he gave them the covenant. Actually, this is Stephen, what am I talking about? And he gave them the, the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day, and Isaac begat Jacob, and, and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. And he's saying that God gave them the covenant. What is that? A, 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 an agreement, a sign, right? That's what that is, that covenant. Look at Genesis chapter 17. This is referring to verse 9. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations, 
This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. So they weren't just doing this, you know, for hygiene or something like that. There was a real spiritual significance behind circumcision. And, it, and you know, it was, it was something they had to do to be a part of the nation of Israel. And what's, what's interesting about this, this is kind of where we're going to get into the, to the, uh, you know, the point of the sermon more so, is that a stranger could receive this sign as well. You know, this was something that was given to Abraham's seed, right? This was something <coughs> that was reserved for those that were of, uh, of the faith of Abraham, right? And his, and his uh, descendants, the nation of Israel. But what's interesting is that a stranger could receive the same covenant as well. And by a stranger, I mean a foreigner, somebody who was not born in the land, somebody who was not of Israel, an outsider to the nation, could receive this covenant and become a, 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 a citizen of Israel. And look there in verse 12, you'll see that. It says in verse 12, And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man, in your, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house, he that is bought with money, must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man whose flesh of, of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. <coughs> He's saying, look, if you bought a money uh, uh, any, uh, or bought with money of any stranger, right? He's saying, look, even if there was a stranger that was there, they are to receive this, this sign of circumcision. Which tells us this, that, you know, it was possible that anybody in the Old Testament, and if you would, go over to Philippians 3, anybody in the Old Testament be, could become a nation of Israel. That's a fact. So this whole, this whole idea that God is just, you know, only cares about a certain bloodline, that God only cares about a certain, you know, race of people, that God only cares about a certain genealogy <coughs> called, you know, the Jews, is not biblical. It's just not biblical, okay? And the fact, you know, you know, they say, well, prove it. Well, how about Esther chapter 8? If we remember the story of Esther, when they conspire to try and kill all the Jews of the land, and then everything gets turned on its head, and the Jews are, are you know, given permission to destroy any of their enemies. And it says in Esther 8, verse 17, And in every providence, in every city, whithersoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness and a feast of a good day, and many of the people of the land did what? Became Jews. They became Jews for the fell the Jews fell upon them, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. So you're talking about people who are, you know, not of the nation of Israel, heathen lands, just all throughout the world, just overnight becoming Jews. You know, and that's something that still goes on today. You know, people convert to Judaism all the time. So when you start to talk about these issues about Judaism and Jews and, and God's chosen people, things like that. It's not an issue of race. It's an issue of religion. It's an issue of belief. What does a person believe? That's what makes you a Jew, is what you believe, what you practice. Not who your daddy was. That's not what it is at all. I mean, you have all kinds of people that were clearly not of the nation of Israel, that are not descendants, that become Jews. I mean, who was that famous singer, the, the, the black guy from a long time? It was Sammy Davis Jr., Right? Became a Jew. You know, and now, do you think that was because he was the long lost tribe of Israel or something like that? No, it's because being a Jew has nothing to do with, you know, uh, what, blood, what blood is flowing in your veins. It has everything to do with what's in your heart as far as what you believe. <coughs> so we see here, you know, strangers were commanded to receive this covenant. There was given them to receive this covenant in, in Esther. And, you know, this even goes on today. Well, actually, today, the, the irony is, is, that, is that some people cannot or forbade from becoming Jews, or they're not allowed to come into the land, you know, despite the, their, their uh, so-called so Jewish ancestry, right? This is a part of the 1970 Ancestry Amendment. Uh, to the, it's the 1970 an Ancestry Amendment to the Law of Return. And that was a law that was established about who was allowed to come back to the modern-day nation of Israel. Big, long subject. But there's certain people that are not allowed. And in fact, even Jews, people who were formerly a Jew, 
Jews who have converted to another religion are not eligible to, emir, uh, to immigrate under the law of return. It's, it's against the law. And that just you know, further proves the point that being Jewish has nothing to do with <clears throat> you know, your blood. It has everything to do with what you believe. But hey, so what? What does it matter you know, what I believe? I'm Jewish. Well, it matters a lot because we don't want people coming in here that don't believe like us, <clears throat> which is kind of a strange law if you ask me. You know, what kind of a religion do you have when you have to forbid people from coming in and bringing another, another gospel, you know, the gospel? <coughs> you know, these Messianic Jews, these, these Jews that get saved, they believe on Christ, and now they want to go back to Israel. They're like, whoa, we don't want you here. Well, what have you got to hide? What are you so afraid of? What, what's the matter with having them there? You know, you're afraid that they might actually convert people away from your false religion? Is that it? The truth fears no investigation. So, see, laws like that are highly suspect. You're there in Philippians chapter 3, look at uh, verse 4. He says, Though I also, uh, might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man, other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching righteousness, which is in the law, blameless. So what's Paul doing here? He's really touting his former credentials. He's really saying, hey, look, I was a, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews, man. I was, I was the guy, I was a model Jew in my day. <clears throat> and of course, we know he says, what things were gained to me, I count but loss. The excellency of the knowledge of Christ. But the point being that a man like that, like the man who had that pedigree, in their religion would not be allowed there today for one simple reason because he believed on Christ by their own law they'd say you're not welcome Paul because you don't have, you have a different religion so people got it you know and it seems like the Jews understand this you know those that practice Judaism they seem to get it that hey yeah it's about a belief it's a belief system it's not a bloodline but there's a lot of Christians today that seem to get mixed up on this topic and think, oh, they, they're, they're automatically saved. You know, the John Haggies of this world that say, oh, the Jews don't have to receive the gospel because, you know, they're automatically in because of the fact that, well, they're Jewish. Well, you mean, well, here's the thing. Whether you realize it or not, John Haggie, what you're saying is they're automatically in because they're Jewish and that means that they believe something other than the gospel? But, but in his mind, he's saying, oh, they're Jewish because... They're automatically in because of the blood that's in their veins. And it's the Christians, and John Hagee's not a Christian, by the way. Yeah. It's, the, it's the people within Christendom that are getting all mixed up on this. That think people that you know, pra practice Judaism are going to get a pass because somehow they're the long-lost descendants of you know, Abraham, which is not true. And anyone who's, you know, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a complicated subject. And, you know, it's not something I'm an expert in, but I've listened to people who have studied it and who know people that are experts in it. Look, there's no way that there's anybody that can claim a direct lineage to the, the, the you know, the, the nation of Israel in Abraham's day or the patriarch's day. It's impossible mathematically, you know, and Pastor Anderson's done a great sermon on that. And he showed that just it, the, the, the exponents that are involved, like there's not even enough people on the earth to make that possible when you go back that far. It's, it's kind of a complicated subject. But just from a mathematical standpoint, there is nobody on the earth today that can say, I am, a, um, I am of a certain tribe that you read about in the Old Testament. It, it's not out there. Anyone who says that is a liar. Yep. <coughs> or stupid or both. <coughs> Excuse me. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. <clears throat> it's interesting what he says. You know what? Go to 1 Corinthians 7. I'll just read 9 to you. He says, and Paul said, Unto the Jews I became as a Jew. Well, wh how can somebody become as a Jew if being a Jew is uh, based on, your, on your, you know, your nationality? It's kind of an odd statement to make. Because anybody, hello, can become a Jew today. <clears throat> if they want to deny Christ and, they, and, and, and follow a false religion. So basically what I'm getting at right now is that biblically speaking, you know, since any nationality, any person on this planet can become Jewish, yes, that's available to you tonight. If you've had enough of this IFB preaching, you know, if you're just wore out with this, 
Judaism as, as another option to consider, folks. Just kidding, right? But anybody could. Anybody could become Jewish. Because being, and because of that fact, being a Jew refers to one's religion and not one's nationality itself. <clears throat> so we see some things about, you know, that's kind of the point I was making there about, you know, the circumcision, that it's just a sign of the faith that we have, that it was a sign of separation, and that other people were to receive it that were not Jews, right? But circumcision like all other Jewish customs, I'm just kind of using that one because it's such a big topic in the Bible, but it could be representative of all other Jewish traditions and customs and practices that they hold to. Circumcision, like all other Jewish customs, count for nothing toward being the people of God. They count for nothing being toward the people of God. I don't care what kind of hat they put on. I don't care how long they grow their little locks or how long they rock back and forth or how, what color apron, how many ribbons of blue they put in what garments, or if they're circumcised, or if they keep the Sabbath, or whatever they do. None of those things make them the people of God. Yeah. None of them. Right. <clears throat> Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 18. Is any man called being uncircumcised, let him, not become, uh, let him not become uncircumcised. Is any called an uncircumcision, let him not be circumcis circumcised. Circumcision is nothing. And uncircumcision is nothing. He's taking their, their part of the law. Just, and again, just, I'm just using it to represent, you could say about, it just represents all these traditions. And saying your commandment that you keep, your law that you're trusting in, your tradition, is nothing. That's what he's doing there. Circumcision's nothing. It doesn't matter. It won't make you the people of God. <coughs> You know, and that point, you know, just, just to kind of, because this is a question that comes up every from time to time, and this is just kind of a, you know, I'm kind of on the topic of circumcision, so you might as well just, you know, you know we, it, we've already got over the awkwardness of it, so I might as well just address it while we're here. But every now and then people ask, you know, hey, do we, do we need to continue to circumcise our children? And really, it's a personal preference. You know, if you do, you know, it's not a sinful thing, but there is no need to do that today. None. Zero. It's not something, and, and I've heard, and I'm going to take the time to mention that because I've heard Baptist preachers counsel people and say, well, you know, you should do it, you know, just so that they can be like unto the nation of Israel. You know, I, I, we, we, we circumcised our son. I'm saying, I didn't do that. We didn't do that. What I'm saying is this is what this preacher said. Well, we did, we circumcised our son because, you know, we wouldn't want him to be associated with like, like a Philistine or something like that, like a heathen. So you can see this mentality that creeps in right. and it just it starts to elevate the Jews. Right. Oh, we got to circumcise our kids so they can be like the Jews. You know, and Paul says it's nothing. Yep. It's nothing. There's no point in it. It's been done away. <clears throat> you know, whether it's circumcision or anything else, there's no need to keep any Jewish tradition since it means nothing. Any holy day, new moon, Sabbath, they're all done away in Christ and they mean nothing. You go, are you in Colossians? Have you go there? Colossians chapter 2. And this is something that Paul goes on and on about in multiple epistles and warns people over and over again. People that want to creep in and bring in, they want to Judaize you. They want to bring Judaism into Christianity today. <coughs> you know, ergo, uh, you know, the Hebrew Roots Movement, yep. which is nothing more than a bunch of Judaizer. Judaizers trying to bring people back under the law. You know, idiots who want to, you know, come and, you know, blow a shofar at church. <laughs> or something like that. Hey, can we blow the shofar before every service? No. <laughs> right. Ain't happening. Well, we, hey, maybe before you pray before the congregation, you should put on a prayer shawl. And <laughs> maybe we should all just get doilies on our hats or something. You know, just so we could be like them. I don't want to be like them. I'm happy with who I am in Christ. More than happy to just be a, a child of God. That's more than I could ever wish for. <clears throat> Look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 8. Beware. All right? This is something he's saying. Well, does this really sound that concerns us? I don't know. Paul took the time to write about it. And he starts out by saying, Beware. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. For ye are complete in Him. We're complete in Christ. 
I don't need to add some Old Testament or some Jewish tradition to my faith to make me feel good about the fact that I'm going to heaven or feel somehow spiritually you know, whole. I'm complete in Christ. Amen. And so are you tonight if you're saved. <clears throat> He's saying, uh, he says there, uh, for, uh, where was I? And not of Christ, but him dwell the full of God. And ye are complete in him, verse 10, which is the head of all principality, excuse me, and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. And the Jew wants to come here, are you circumcised? Yeah, I am, in Christ, yeah. without hands. Right. It's a circumcision of the heart, something they know nothing about, because they have hardened their hearts. <clears throat> I am circumcised uh, in the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. That's the picture that God was giving them in the Old Testament. That by faith in, in, by faith in God, by the righteousness that comes by faith in believing, you are severed. You are, it, the, the reproach of, is, of Egypt is rolled off of you. You've been made different. You're, you're separated from it. You've been brought out of the world. You've put away, the, the, the flesh is, is, is put away from you. Do you see the picture there? That's what he's, he's kind of drawing, that, 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 uh, that line there. <coughs> Verse 12, Buried with him in baptism, where else you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with you, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over it in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in speck of holy day or of new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are what? Verse 17, a shadow of the things to come, but the body is of Christ. <clears throat> these people that want to observe these type of you know, the, we got they, we got to observe the Sabbath. They want to, you know, eat the kosher meal. They want to, you know, circumcise. They want to, you know, whatever vain tradition they want to bring back in. Whatever ordinance that was contrary to us, they want to put back in our lives. You know what those people are doing? They're looking at the shadow. They're not beholding the sun. They're looking at the shadow. You know what they're doing? They're walking in darkness. <clears throat> That's what they're doing. They're too busy looking at the shadow. They can't even see the sun they can't see the lord jesus christ the picture who is the picture of those things that are is yet to come the bible says if we walk in the light as he is in the light we have fellowship one with another and the blood of jesus christ cleanses us from all his son you can have your shadow go ahead and you have your shadow the old of the of the ordinances and the and the, of those things that were contrary to us go ahead and have that you can have the shadow all day long i'll i'll walk in the light with christ and i'll be complete in him and I won't need some vain tradition to be added to my faith. No thank you, Hebrew Roots Movement. No thank you, Judaizers. You can have your shadow. Go ahead and continue to walk in darkness if that's what you want to do. But don't expect me to join you. <clears throat> you know, and I can say that with boldness because of the fact, and this is really what I want to drive home tonight, is that we are God's people. There I said it. We are God's people and not them. And I'm not going to stand here and let somebody take that away from me. Right. And I'm not going to get brainwashed, and I don't want any of you to get brainwashed or make you feel like you're somehow some kind of second-class citizen. And there's plenty of preachers that even get into Baptist churches today and stand up and try to make the congregation that they're preaching to, God's children, God's people whom he died for, yep. feel like they're second-class to a bunch of Christ-rejecting Jews. Right. I'm not going to stand for it. <clears throat> we are God's people because of the faith and the blood of Christ. Because of the blood that Jesus Christ shed for us. Right. Not because I wear a hat, some funny hat, yep. and I keep some stupid traditions. Right. None of that. That's not why I'm special. That's not what makes me special tonight. That's not what makes me so bold to get up and say, I am God's child, that we are God's people. Amen. Not because of some inherent goodness in any of us but because of Christ, because of the blood of Jesus Christ, that precious and holy name that they blaspheme yeah. and say things about that I don't even dare repeat right. in this auditorium because they're so wicked and blasphemous. 
<clears throat> Are you, I didn't have you go there. First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2. This is a great passage. We should, we should know this passage. This is one of the most encouraging and empowering and just dear uh, passages in the Word of God that we can read. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, But ye are a chosen generation. Who is he speaking to? He's speaking to Gentiles. He's not writing to a bunch of Jews. He's speaking to Gentile people. He, he says, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in times past were not a people, but now the people of God, which hath not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. And I want you to pay special attention to this word in verse 10. It says, which in times past were not a pe people, but are now the people of God. The singular. Not, not another people of God. Not, not, a, not a second class citizen. Right. Not somebody who's just, you know, been fortunate enough to have stumbled into this. And that God, you know, didn't have anything better to do and decided, well, I guess I'll save them too. You know, he says, you are the people of God to the exclusion of all others. That there is no other people of God out there today if they're not in Christ. Yep. If you're not in Christ, you know, if you have not the Father, you have not the Son. Period. <clears throat> the Bible couldn't be clearer. clearer. <clears throat> in the same way, and how is it that we are we become the, the, the people of God? Go over to Galatians chapter three. Galatians, Galatians chapter three. How can I get up here and say that we are the people of God? How does that happen to somebody? Is it because you were born into it? Is it because you know you have some lineage or you have some kind of a you know pedigree about you? Is that what makes us the people of God tonight? I mean, if I got up here and said oh, we're the people of God tonight because of you know, who, who our parents were. Wouldn't that sound just a little racist? Yes. Wouldn't that sound just a little arrogant and puffed up and prideful? But that's exactly what people say about the Jews. Right. Oh, they're God's people just because of the fact that, well, who their daddy was. Is that why we are today? No. We're, the same, we're God's people the same reason Abraham was. What makes us God people, God's people is, what, is the same thing that made Abraham God's people. Faith. That's it. Faith in Christ. That's the one thing. Look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. It was his faith in God that made Abraham righteous, not his works. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. Hey, if you're, if, if you're of faith tonight, you're a child of Abraham. You're, you're the Jew tonight, folks. Yep. You are Jew, right? <laughs> That's the title of the sermon. Jew are you, rather. That's who we are. Because why? Because we are they which are, uh, are by faith and not in our, anything of our own selves, not our pedigree. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, And these shall all nations be blessed. In thee shall one small nation in the Middle East be blessed. In thee shall just one you know, nation come to fruition in 1948 and they'll be blessed. No, in thee all nations shall be blessed. <coughs> because that seed that was going to come from Abraham is Christ. Amen. That was the seed he's referring to. And all nations and kindreds and tongues are blessed in Christ. <coughs> Verse 9, so they which are be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. The Jew tonight or anybody else that wants to trust in their works is cursed. Because none of them, nobody is doing all of it. And they can't, you know, the, he's making it perfectly clear here. You can't just say, well, I like that law. I like this tradition. Oh, that commandment fits my lifestyle. Yeah, I'll do those. He's saying, look, you want to do them? You're, if you're, if you're going to keep the law, you're a debtor to do the whole law. And if you don't do it, you're cursed. Whoso, I mean, is that not what it says in verse 10? For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all the things which are written 
in the book of the law to do them? But that man, verse 11, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. It's obvious he's saying. I mean, we, anyone who has any sense is going to understand that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. That when the law came, sin revived, and I died. Then we say, then we see, oh, I need a savior. I need somebody to come and save me because I can't keep the law. He's saying, look, that no man is justified in the law of God, in, in, in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live therein, and live in them, right? The man that shall do them shall live in them. You know, again, if you kept the whole law today, from birth onward, you could go right to heaven. You wouldn't even need Jesus. But that's the point he's making, is that nobody's done that. That's why it's evident. <clears throat> he says in verse 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. How do I get up here tonight and say, hey, we're all, we are God's people? It's because we have the faith that Abraham had. Because the righteousness of Abraham is the same righteousness that we have. It's the righteousness that is imputed unto us through faith and not anything else. So you tonight, you, the believer in Christ, you are the Jew tonight. That was the, that was the point of that title, as odd and strange as that sounded, and still does. Jew are you, right? Who are you? Jew are you. That's who you are tonight. You are the true Jew tonight. Amen. Not these imposters that are over there. Go back to Romans if you kept something there. Romans chapter 2, verse 26. Paul just spells it out plainly and tells us who the real Jews are and who isn't. And, you know, and that's why it's no coincidence that Jews hate the New Testament. And they, they have just vitriol for Paul. You go watch Marching to Zion and you listen to, you know, what was Leo Abrami or whatever. I mean, the way he brings up Paul, that's what Paul was preaching, you know. You know what I'm talking about if you've seen the movie. They get, I mean, Paul triggers these guys. They hate the New Testament. It's, and it's obvious why, because it condemns them. And it takes their, their precious little title that they, they think they claim of God's chosen people and gives it unto the Gentiles. And that's exactly what happened, though. And, the Gentile, and that's, that's the way it is because, again, it's not anything that's in us, not by our own works, uh, you know, but by his, by his grace he saved us. We understand that all our righteousness is as filthy rags. Everyone that's saved, no one's trusting in their, no saved person's trusting in their works, so they're not saved. They're not trusting in their vain tradition. They're trusting in Christ. So you and I are the real Jew, you, the believer. Jew are you. Romans chapter 2, look at verse 26. Therefore, if the circumcision... Hey, you straighten up right now. Verse 26. Therefore, if the circumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision? Shall not, and shall not the uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does trans trans transgress the law? Verse 28, for he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. He's saying the, Jew, the guy who, who looks like a Jew that everyone calls a Jew, that's not the Jew. The guy at the wailing wall, the guy dressed in all black, head to toe, you know, and everything else, you know what I'm talking about. That guy, Paul is saying, is not the Jew. Jerry Seinfeld, not the Jew. Steven Spielberg, not the Jew. You know, whatever Silver, Spielberg, or any other Stein or anything, I think Stein's German, but you know, any other you know, Jewish name that's out there that says, oh, I'm a Jew. Not a Jew, according to the Bible. <clears throat> they might look like it outwardly. Oh, they all have all the trappings of the Jew. They're there in Israel. You know, they're doing, they're doing all these Jewish things. They eat all their kosher meals. Not a Jew, according to the Bible. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart and in the spirit, 
not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. And you know what? The world might never look at us and say, oh, you guys are God's chosen people and lift us up and send us billions of dollars in aid every year. You know, that's not going to happen. But you know what? They can have it. Because I'm not interested in the praise of men. I have the praise of God tonight. Because my circumcision is inward in the heart. I'm a Jew inwardly. And I have praise of God. <clears throat> and you know what? Shame on every Christian who says otherwise. Shame on every other Christian who wants to lift up that wicked, blasphemous religion called Judaism and tell us that we owe them some kind of respect. Shame on them. Shame on every single Christian who sides with them or anybody else that blasphemes the name of Christ. Shame on them. They ought to know better. <clears throat> so the question I want to kind of end the sermon with tonight is, where does that leave the imposters? If we, believers in Christ, are the real Jews tonight, which we are, according to the Bible, where does that leave these imposters over there? <clears throat> and make no mistake about it, they are imposters. I don't believe a single one of them has a, a drop of, that, I, of, of, of any of that blood that goes back to Abraham and his descendants. Not a drop. It's been, I mean, no more than you or I. It's been so diluted and mingled. They've been scattered among so many nations. I mean, the ten of the tribes were gone before we even got out of the, te of the Old Testament. Yep. The Samaritans. Hello? So I don't believe that for a second. I mean, they are imposters tonight. <laughs> That's what the Bible says. Go over to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 2, I know thy works in tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not. The Bible's showing us, and we're going to look at another passage in the next chapter because it repeats this exact phrase. It says that there are people out there that say they are Jews and are not. Well, who are these people? Who could they be? It says they are the synagogue of Satan. And there's only one religion, folks, that uses a synagogue. And it's Judaism. And God calls it satanic. And you say, well, that's kind of harsh. That's anti-Semitic. Call it whatever you want. I'm a Bible-believing Christian. And I'm, I'm sick and tired of having this Zionist, Jew-worshipping crap put in my face right. by other so-called Christians. Right. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, anyway. Where does that leave the imposters? Where does that leave them? It leaves them in the, the needing to hear the same message that Peter preached. And it's not that I hate them. It's not that I have some kind of, you know, though they hate my God and they hate me, and you know what, I probably, maybe I should start hating people that hate the Lord a little bit more. Do not I hate them that hate the old Lord? Yeah, I hate them with a perfect hatred. But you know what, maybe there are just some out there that are just, a lot of them are just confused. They were just brought up in it. They were put in their, their schools. They were taught the language. They just, it's not that they hate the Lord. It's just they're Jews. That's what they were taught. Just like any false religion. But where does that leave these imposters? It leaves them needing to hear the same message that Peter preached here in Acts 4. Look at verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if this day we be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man by what means he has made hold, be it none unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him, doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which is set at not of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. What part of this does the Zionist not understand? What part of this do people like Sam Gipp and these dispensationalists not understand? Right. That there is no other name given under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And that they're damning Jews and people who are caught up in this false religion to hell by not preaching them Christ, by not telling them that, hey, your religion, your bloodline, so-called, is not going to get you there. <clears throat> They need to hear the same message, these imposters. They need to hear the same message that Jeremiah preached. Go over to Matthew chapter 8. I'll read you Jeremiah's message. 
For thus saith the Lord of, to, to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break you up your fallow ground, and sow not among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire, and burn that none can quench it, because of the evil of your doings. And there's a lot of evil going on over there even today. I mean, Tel Aviv is, is the homo friendliest place in the world, apparently. Tel Aviv. That's where they all want to go. And they're over there blaspheming Christ and, 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 you know, the genocide and everything that's going on. And the irony is, is that the Palestinian probably has a closer link to Abraham and his descendants than they ever will. Talk about irony of ironies. <clears throat> that's the message they need to hear. Hey, quit doing your evil works and circumcise your heart. Why don't you let the preacher in? Why don't you let the Christian in and let him and, and proselytize your people and actually teach them the truth and get you out of that false religion? <clears throat> they need to hear the message Jesus preached. Well, that is a, this doesn't sound very like a very loving sermon, Brother Corbin. Well, let's see what Jesus said to them. Let's, let's turn back the clock and see what Jesus' attitude was towards these people. Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. Jesus speaking, And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. What's he saying there? That many shall come from the east and from the west. He's talking about there's going to be people from all over the world that come and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, your fraternal you know, descendants. You know, those that came before you. Those that at that time, they probably could link themselves to geneal genealogically. But he's saying, look, there's going to be a lot of people that come from the east and the west, and they're going to sit down with your forefathers in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom, and he's referring directly to them. He's telling them right to their face. But you, the children of the kingdom, shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I mean, Jesus didn't hold back. Jesus wasn't afraid to just tell him, hey, you're going to end up in hell. That special seat that you think you have in heaven, it's not there. It's not waiting for you because you haven't trusted in me because you're rejecting me. That's what Jesus said. Go over to Mark chapter 12. Let's see some more about what, what Jesus had to say to them, about them. In the parable <clears throat> in Mark 12, where he's sending you know, the servants over and over again to the, to the keepers of the vineyard. The master is you know, sending people to his vineyard, which is representative of the prophets and, and those that came before Christ to preach, you know, uh, uh, to preach to them, to get them right with God. <clears throat> it says in verse 6, And having yet therefore one son, well beloved, does that not sound familiar? You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's who he's referring to here. Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last unto them. And by the way, he's saying, hey, this is it. He sent unto them last. Meaning, I'm not sending anybody else after this. I've sent you prophets after prophet after prophet, and you've slain them, and you've killed them, and you've beaten them, and you've chased them off, and you've disregarded them. And now at last I'm sending you my own beloved son. <clears throat> and he says here, he sent him also unto them last, saying, they will reverence my son. That's what he was hoping when, G when he sent Jesus down to preach to them. When Jesus said, go not into, into in the house of the Samaritans or the Gentiles, but to the lost house of the tribes, uh, sheep of the tribes of Israel. That's what he wanted. He wanted them to revere him. But what happened? He came unto his own, and his own received him not. And he said, they will reverence my son, verse 7, but those husbandmen said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill it, and the inheritance shall be ours. Now, I can't help it. Every time I read that, this is what I see. <laughs> right? The greedy Jew. <laughs> the inheritance shall be ours. What do they want? They want the vineyard. They want some earthly possession. That's how important it is to them. Money. And they took him and killed him and cast him out of the vineyard. What therefore shall the Lord of the vineyard do? Oh, well, they can't help it, you know, but they, hey, they're still God's chosen people. After all, you know, they're descendants of Abraham, so. He will come and destroy the husbandmen and will give the vineyard unto others. He's saying, oh, you're not going to reverence my son? Then I'm just going to destroy you. 
I'm just going to come and wipe you off the face of the earth and give it to somebody else who will. And that's us. Who will, you know who's going to get the vineyard? Us. The meek shall inherit the earth. <clears throat> Those that have trusted in Christ. <clears throat> that's what they need. That's what the imposters need tonight. You know, and this is kind of a caveat that I'm, or I'm tagging on the end of this sermon. Because I don't want people to walk out of here just thinking, you know, we hate Jewish people or something. Because we don't. We want them to be saved like anybody else. We've knocked nearly every door in Tempe, a highly Jewish neighborhood. You know, I've knocked a Jew's door and said, hey, can I show you, uh, are you 100% sure you're going to go to heaven when you die? Of course, I'm Jewish. <laughs> that was his response. Well, I tried. I've knocked on doors where they have, you know, their little scrolls above their door. I don't walk up to it, oh, that's a Jew, never mind. Right. Oh, there's a star of Remphan, or David here. Never mind, I'll just forget it. Right. <clears throat> and it's not because I go, oh, well, they're, they're good. <laughs> I heard John Hagee, what he had to say. And these people they don't even need to hear what I had to say. No, they need it. And that's why we bring it, because we still love them. They need to hear this. And so do the Christians out there today that have been brainwashed into thinking that they don't need to hear it. They need to hear this too. They need to hear these messages that have been preached to them by Peter and the apostles and the prophets and Jesus Christ himself, they need to hear that message, the message that they must trust in Christ like everybody else because they're nothing special like everybody else. Go back over to Romans 9. Hopefully you kept something there. <clears throat> Romans 9, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, but their minds were blinded. For until this day there remaineth the same veil untaken taken away in the reading of the Old Testament which veil is done away in Christ. They're getting up in their synagogues. I don't know if they read the Torah or whatever anymore. But even if they did, they're reading it with the blindfold is what the Bible's saying. They can't understand it. But it will be taken away in Christ. You know, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can they know them, for they are foolishness unto him, for they are spiritually discerned. You have to have the Spirit of Christ to understand the Word of God. And they don't have that. The veil, it says, is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now, it doesn't say that the veil is going to be taken away when Jesus comes back and they behold Him. Oh, now we'll believe on Christ. That's, you know, some people want to interpret that. It, it's when they trust in Christ, when they turn from their false way, like every, everybody else that has ever gotten saved had to do, turn from their their, their false unbelief unto Christ, that veil is lifted in our hearts and we can understand the things of God. Look at Romans uh, chapter 9, verse 6. These people, they need to trust in Christ. That's what we want for them. That's what we want for everybody. Not as though, verse 6, not as though the word of God hath not taken effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed by be called. That is, they are the children of the flesh, and these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. And that's the picture there of, of Isaac's children, Esau and uh, um, Jacob. Jacob. Thank you. Is that, you know, the, the, the Esau, you know, he came first, but he did not, you know, he, got, he was hated. You know, he rejected God's way. And then it was Jacob that, that received the promise. Jump down to verse 30. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. The Gentiles got the righteousness. They're the ones that have, who weren't even following after it, but they attained it. You know, he says, I was found of them that sought me not. You know, that's us. <clears throat> verse 31. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness... They followed after the law. That was their problem. As they got caught up in following the law and hath not attained the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith. They need to trust in Christ. They need to put their faith in Him. Or they're going to just continue trying to follow the law. And that's not going to be good enough. And they're not going to attain unto the law of righteousness. Because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at the stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Sion 
a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. You know, and, and people today, they might disagree with what I had to preach tonight. I don't think anybody in this room does. But there are people out there that would disagree with me. And they would say, no, the Jews are still God's chosen people. You know, we need to reverence them and bless them. And, and, and God's not through with Israel. No, he's through with them, friend. He sent his son last, and then he said, I will miserably destroy those wicked servants. He's done with them. And unless they turn to Christ and trust in him, that veil will remain on their hearts until the day they die and split hell wide open. And they need to trust in Christ. And whether, you know, the Zionists of this world and anybody that's been brainwashed by and believes that or not, one day Jesus is going to make it perfectly clear. And go to Revelation chapter 3. We'll finish there. One day Jesus is going to make it perfectly clear to everyone who he loves and who he doesn't. He's going to make it perfectly clear who his chosen people are and who isn't. And he's going he's to show everybody. And the, and the argument's going to be over. There's going to be no disputing it. Revelation chapter 3, verse 9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. You know, one day we are going to sit down in that kingdom with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen. And they're going to see it. And everybody else is too. And there's going to be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. And no one's going to sit down at that table and wonder anymore who God's chosen people are and who they aren't. He's just going to say it's perfectly clear who it is and who it isn't. And so all we can do in the meantime, we understand this, but all we can do is just try to win these people like we try to win everybody else. And if we can't win them, then let's warn them. And no matter, you know, like Paul did, you know, like Jesus did, he's trying to win them, and if he couldn't do that, he warned them. You know, so no matter what they choose to believe, they choose to reject Christ or they choose to believe on Christ, don't let anyone ever rob you of the fact that you are God's chosen people through Christ. Let's go ahead and pray.